Uh, uh, most of you know Lisa as a, uh, a globe-trotting, award-winning journalist who is paying very close attention to her early education and its quality in America. She is one of the leaders on policy and on uh, understanding and analyzing the role that technology and media can play. She's not an oncologist. She's not a champion. She calls it as she sees it. And we're so pleased to welcome her to moderate the panel. Lisa Gerzik. Very kind. Um, so this has been just fabulous already this morning. Um, I'm I'm already I have a million questions on my own, but I'm holding back and excited to kind of maybe seed a few of them as we have uh, go move into this next session and talk about really kind of maximizing impact. Uh, what what can we as a community? What can everybody in this room and the amazing resources at our fingertips do to kind of move the needle, especially for uh, children who don't have the kind of access um, to really cool uh, content and opportunities um, that a lot of affluent children have. I'm going to take just a moment to give you a, a little bit of a sense of how things have moved and changed even in the past year or two around some of these issues. And, um, and then we're going to move into a, the same kind of an engaging, uh, moderated discussion as we had in the last panel. Um, before I do that, though, I just want to take a minute to, um, to recognize what I think is really important about this report and this study as Vicki Rideout has designed it. For a very long time, the way parents and you know, society has talked about media and kids has been around the issue of how much time children are spending. And it's been very frustrating to those of us who kind of looked at the research on what that time needs to children to recognize that there's been so little talk about the content. What are children doing with that time? What are they seeing on the screen? And obviously, we have a long way to go to unpack kind of what it means for something to be educational or not, what it means to have children kind of become makers um, as much as consumers. But at least we've got a place now and some data points to start talking about what kind of learning is happening when children are spending time with media. And I just wanted to say that's, that's big. I think it's really big for this community. I think it's a big message to get out there in the wider world. Um, when I speak at preschools um, to parents, when I get a lot of calls from reporters, I mean, the first question is always, well, gosh, kids are spending two hours. What do you think? It's just always about time. And um, time is important, absolutely, but there has to be a much more multi-textured conversation when we can start having that because of data points like this. OK, so let me tell you about a couple of things that have been happening in the um, early learning world. And, and I hope that these might just spark some things. And as we're talking and we're hearing from some of the provocateurs in a moment, um, Think yourself about whether you might have something to add um, to bring up about what your organization might be doing that can, can help to show the, the, the foment that might be happening in this area. I direct the Early Ed Initiative at New America, which is a policy um, institute in Washington, D.C., and we focus primarily on just how to scale up the learning environments for young kids. But as many of you know, I came from the world of journalism. I've written a book on media kids from a parent's perspective and trying to really dig into the research. And uh, we are now at a place where we can start marrying some of that, where we can start taking more of what we know from the, from the research and from what parents really need and are desperate to understand and bring that into the world of preschool policy, into the world of kindergarten, first, second, third grade school settings, into kind of family engagement policies, into what we understand about how home visiting programs for um, first-time mothers with infants might be working in, in, in how it's bringing, um, how they might be able to harness technology to help those kinds of programs. And I just want to tell you about a couple of um, initiatives underway. Um, one is the that there's been a group that's formed called the Alliance for Early Learning in a Digital Age. And it's a combination of a lot of different organizations, including the Outset Prevention Fund, Fred Rogers Center, um, Sesame Workshop, Joan Vance Coney Center, um, Erickson Institute, 
PBS, Sesame, I hope I'm getting everyone. I didn't have the exact list in front of me, but this is a group of really that are thoughtful people who are trying to grapple with this issue of how media fits into early learning in the digital age. And I think over the next few years, you'll hear more about that group and what they want to do. At the New America, um, at New America, with this, this institute right come from Washington D.C., we hosted a research discussion in October to try to distill where some common ground lies among just the research that we know and how children learn best from media when it's getting in the way of their learning and when it's not. And we're going to be holding an event on March 26th in, in D.C. that'll be an open event to try to air some of that and bring in some of the policy implications to that. Um, there's also the Campaign for Grade Level Reading, which is a national movement to bring more attention to the um, really distressing reading scores in this country. It may not be something that everyone in this room is aware of, but uh, third and fourth graders are, are really not becoming proficient readers at the rate that they need to. And the national data shows that um, over two-thirds of kids in fourth grade are not reading at grade level. Two-thirds. That's not like divided by income level. It's just of all of our kids in this country, two-thirds. And if you do, if you start looking at it by demographics, um, it gets even more upsetting and distressing, especially for low-income kids and kids of color. So this group, the Campaign for Grade Level Reading, has been taking a lot of different steps to uh, address this in communities at the state level. But one of the interesting things is that they're looking at technology and where media and technology fit into that question of like how do we help children get to that place where they're feeling like they're strong readers and they're excited to pick up a book and read when they're um, in fourth grade. And we at, at New America with the John Yance Community Center are working on a, a multi-year project to try to bring some light to how technology can be used to engage parents in the reading classes with their kids, or just even in conversation and things that um, open up uh, their, their language skills and their kind of understanding of, of what's happening in the world. Um, two other just quick things to note. Um, there's an Institute of Medicine committee that has been formed, um, a National um, Research Council IOM committee, that is looking at what the science of, of kids up to age eight and what the workforce really needs to know. And I'm on that committee, and what was really encouraging to me in the first meeting in December was that the concept of how, you know, where's technology in this? What are kids using? What are they using at home? What does the workforce need to know about the kinds of media children are using at home? That was absolutely in the center of the discussion. And so that will lead to some, some reports later that, that, that will come out um, about a year from now. Um, lastly, and then we can get into our provocateurs, um, we put out a report last, uh, this week at New America called Subprime Learning Early Education in America Since the Great Recession. And it was a look back over the last five years looking at not just preschool but birth through third grade outcomes and policies to see whether we've been making any progress as a country, especially for kids um, in need. And the bottom line is we're really stagnating. Um, the past five years have not been good to, uh, to families and to kids um, in those younger years. And one of the things that we found that really was ignored over the past five years in, in policy was how to harness media and technology to help make a difference. So we're hoping that by spotlighting that that's been ignored for five years, maybe we can turn the tables on that. And there'll be more to come on that soon. Okay. All right, so that's just a sense of people. We are talking about it. That's the good news. Um, we're going to break this out into a couple of different topic areas. And one of the things we want to focus on is the data in this report that looks at low-income uh, families and minority families and how they are um, feeling about the media that's in their homes and how they are defining it themselves as educational and why. And, and we, Fabian um, Doucet, who is an associate professor at NYU, could not be here today um, because she's gotten terribly ill. Um, this is January, it has to end, right? <laughs> I mean, it's gotta end, like, for all of us. Like, it's just been tough. 
Um, so I know that she really would have had some really interesting um, points to make. She focuses on um, low-income families and also um, understands home daycare settings and what they need for low-income families. But we have amazing people in the room who can help speak to this as well. And so I want to call on a couple of them to try to unpack a little bit of what these, these statistics, these, these data mean to us when it comes to low-income um, and minority youth.